Okay, I guess we can start. Um, a great pleasure to have Mark again here, uh, telling us about introduction to amplitudes, the second part. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I want to start. Uh, there was a question about this, but also I thought it, I thought it's good to get this on record. Um, let, let me just say a word um, about uh, massive uh, spinner helicity, and this gives me another. This gives me an opportunity to cite another one of uh, Uten's nice papers. Uh, where you can find uh, many more examples and details written out here. So when you have a massive particle uh, on shell, its momentum satisfies p squared equals m squared. So recall that last time we said that you could think about this p as a two by two matrix. And previously, in the case of massless particles, the condition p squared equals m squared translated into the determinant of that matrix being zero. Didn't you say Here, it would be negative m square? Oh, yes. Um, yes, this is a choice of which, uh, thank you, this is a choice of which space-time signature you're using. Um, sure. Uh, actually, for, for, for what I'm doing right now, it actually doesn't matter so much. So I'll put plus or minus there. Um, and then th those of you who prefer one signature or the other can, uh, can, uh, can take your pick. Okay, so I'll write here, uh, choice of signature. Okay, so now when we write uh, the uh, 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 the uh, momentum four vector as a two by two matrix, as we did last time, instead of saying that the determinant should be zero, it should be non-zero, plus or minus m squared. So in particular, this means that the two by two matrix has rank two, not rank one, uh, like in the massless case. So we can no longer decompose it in terms of a single spinner helicity variable. Instead, we need a pair of spinner helicity variables. Uh, variables, uh, and we'll denote them lambda alpha i and lambda tilde alpha dot i, where i now runs from one to two. Alpha and alpha dot, just like last time, uh, are indices in the SU2 left and SU2 right subgroups of the four-dimensional Lorentz uh, subalgebras of the four-dimensional Lorentz algebra. Okay, so then we can decompose uh, P alpha alpha dot as lambda alpha i, lambda tilde alpha dot i with uh, implied sum over alpha, uh, sorry, uh, implied sum over i. Now again, um, Given the p, there's not a unique set of lambda and lambda tilde. Uh, so such a choice of lambda, lambda tilde is not unique. Oops, I can't spell. Un Oops. Wait a minute. Ah. Okay, how do I make this disappear? There we go. It is not unique. Um, instead, there is a um, there is an SL two redundancy because if you take lambda alpha i and replace it by any uh, two by two matrix. Uh, lambda uh, alpha j, and similarly lambda tilde alpha dot goes to the inverse matrix, lambda tilde j alpha dot, then p is unchanged. This is the analog of our um, in fact, this SL2 could, could, could be GL2 um, for the moment. Yeah, let me put GL2 here at the moment to be more precise. Um, 
So you multiply the pair of lambdas by any invertible two by two matrix. You multiply the lambda tildes by the inverse of that matrix, and that obviously will keep P unchanged. This is the analog of our ability for the massless spinner helicity variables, just to, they're the, instead of GL2, we have GL1. Okay, you can multiply lambda by any non-zero number and multiply lambda tilde by one over that number. Okay. Okay, so then um, uh, the, way to the way to implement the Lorentz symmetry is then just to say that amplitudes, let me, let me write this. Uh, well, must be symmetric. This is really the key point. Symmetric rank 2s tensors in the indices to s uh, for a particle of spin s. So I should say massive particle. Okay, so just, just to review, um, I, I, this sentence might not be fully clear until we do an example in a moment, but just to set the stage, remember that a massless particle of spin s, uh, except for the special case um, s equals zero, scalar field, um, except for that special case, a massless particle of spin s has basically two polarization states, one with helicity s, and the other with helicity minus s. But if you have a massive particle, you can go to its rest frame, and then uh, if the particle has spin s, you actually have two s plus one different states because you have the max, you know, uh, choose an axis to be your z-axis. You have the state with maximum angular momentum around the z-axis, and then you can, uh, you know, look at states with lower angular momentum all the way down to the state with uh, angular momentum along the negative z-axis. So altogether, that collection of states fills out a uh, 2s plus 1 dimensional uh, space that we can represent in terms of uh, uh, tensors of rank 2s. So th this is probably familiar for, uh, to you from just from studying uh, spin and quantum mechanics, but all the details are worked out nicely in the appendix of the paper I cited. Um, but let me just give, just to, 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 to get our hands dirty here, let me write an example. Um, and this example is taken also from that paper, just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so um, consider, just so you understand what that sentence means that I just wrote. So let's do an example. Consider a four particle uh, amplitude involving, uh, so I'm going to give four particles here, one, two, three, and four. Number one will be a massive fermion. Number two will also be a massive fermion. Number three will be a massless uh, Gravitino, why not? Uh, and number four will be a massless graviton with spin minus one. Okay, so um, for this collection of particles, a candidate, okay, uh, amplitude, I'll explain what that word means in a second. Okay, that means Uh, one that satisfies, um, now I'm going to do something cool. I'm going to refer back to previous lecture, long, long ago.
Okay, here. Remember the fundamental assumption of S matrix theory is that the Poincaré group acts on the S matrix as it does on individual particle states. Okay, so in the example that we're considering, and we used that to great effect last time looking at massless particles. Now in the example we're considering, we have two massive particles, so we need to write down uh, a candidate expression. What could an amplitude for this collection of particles possibly be so that it transforms correctly under the little groups of each of the four particles separately? Okay. Well, let me just write, uh, write down an example and then we'll discuss it. It looks like this. Okay, so I'm not done writing it. This is just the first term, but let me explain what I mean. The bracket here is the uh, spinner helicity bracket, just like we considered last time. Um, except now remember that the massive particles um, carry this extra index. So this literally means lambda 2 j 1 lambda 3. The spinner helicity variable of uh, particle 2 with index j 1. I'm sorry, and I changed the bracket. Why did I do that? Sorry. Lambda tilde. Uh, together with lambda tilde for particle 3. So that's what that means. Okay, now let me continue writing my expression. 2j2, 3, 2j2, 3, times 1j1, uh, 2j4, one, one, not quite done yet, times Here, and here I'm introducing some new notation, which I'll have to introduce in just a second. What this means is, um, oops. So if you play these games for a while, you, you can get pretty familiar with this. Um, I won't do any more complicated examples. This means, think about this as a, the two by two matrix P1 times the two by two matrix P2 sandwiched in between, uh, uh, you know, lambda four. L lambda four is a two component object. Um, and so you've got this lambda four on both sides. Um, and so the indices, the two indices, if you want to be absolutely specific, this would be like P1, alpha alpha dot p2 beta beta dot lambda 4 oops lambda 4 uh, gamma lambda 4 delta and then indices are always contracted with the epsilon symbol so this would be epsilon alpha dot beta dot that contracts these two indices. And then I have epsilon delta alpha to contract these two indices. And then the last thing I need is an epsilon beta gamma. Okay. So if, if, you, if you find yourself needing to get uh, into the details of these calculations, you'll learn all kinds of really uh, helpful notations. Like this complicated, this complicated object here is, is just written in this very simple uh, bracket form here. I'm still not quite done. I'm almost done. Uh, plus, symmet the, you have to symmetrize in all the indices, J1, J2, J3, J4. Okay. Now, uh, let's go through each of the particles uh, one at a time and check that this candidate amplitude indeed scales correctly according to uh, the little group for each particle. Um, oh, and I'm sorry. See, again, I've done, what on earth am I doing? There's a typo here. 
See, the good news is we would have uncovered the typo just by looking at the amplitude. Okay. Particle number two should have been massive spin two. I apologize for that. All right. Let's look at this expression here. So particle one is a massive spin a half particle. That means this thing should be fully anti-symmetric tensor uh, with, with one index. Okay, so there's nothing to symmetrize. Um, uh, oh, and uh, you know what? I just realized. I'm sorry, I'm doing a very bad job here. This is confusing because I have two J1s. Uh, let me introduce a second. Okay, the, in, the index for particle one should be separate from the indices for particle two. Okay, but you see how I'm discovering my mistakes like dynamically as we go, because it's easy to look at this expression and, and see whether or not you made an error. Okay, so here we have particle one uh, uh, appearing uh, with a single index. And you, there's nothing to do. You don't need to symmetrize if you have a single index. But it has spin a half. Uh, S equals a half. So 2S is equal to 1. So you should have one index. Good. Uh, now, particle number 2 has spin 2. So it should be fully symmetric in four indices. Here we have J1, J2. I have J2 twice. That should be J3. J1, J2, J3, J4. And then I've manifestly fully symmetrized it. Particle number three is massless and has helicity three halves. Remember, that means that it should scale as the third power of the lambda tilde, of the lambda tilde spinner helicity variable. And if we look at this expression, indeed, we see one, two, three powers of lambda tilde sub three. Finally, particle number four is a massless particle with helicity minus one. Uh, so it should have, it should scale like two powers of the spinner helicity variable lambda. And we see that here, here, and here. Okay, so at this point, I've concluded myself after fixing a few typos that this expression does uh, satisfy the correct little group uh, representation requirement for each of the four particles involved. Um, and I'm definitely uh, open for questions if there's any confusion at this point. Okay. Now I call this a candidate amplitude because I haven't yet specified a theory or a Lagrangian. So the point is um, there are other candidate amplitudes one can write down. But a finite number of them. Well, there's a finite number of expressions that, 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 uh, the, uh, a finite number of them modulo, you always have the ability to multiply by arbitrary functions uh, of Mandelstam invariance. So strictly speaking, there are infinitely many of them because I could take this thing and multiply by s to any power. Okay, but just the game of isolating these, these uh, products of brackets and things like that, that's a finite problem. And then you need, a, you need to specify Lagrangian or you need to specify some other way to determine the coefficients of each of those candidate terms in an actual amplitude. So to finish my sentence here of Mandelstam and Barry. Anyway, uh, I'm going to finish talking about massive spinner helicity here. I just wanted to bring it up. Uh, first of all, someone asked about it last time, but also to emphasize that it's not mo any much more difficult. Uh, uh, in fact, it's quite beautiful. In, in my opinion, um, it's dramatically uh, understudied the, uh, compared to 
what people have looked at in the in the massless cases. So, so um, you know, there are a lot of fun things that you can do with this um, with this formalism. Okay. All right, but now um, let's move back into the massless world, and I just want to quickly say um, something about spin two. Last time we carefully went through the, um, we looked at the three particle amplitudes for uh, particles of helicity one and minus one. And then we looked a little bit at the factorization of the four particle amplitude. And we deduced that the structure constants have to satisfy the Jacobi identity in order for factorization to be consistent. Now, if you take our main formula, well, from last time, and plug in what you get for helicity plus or minus two, you get the following basic amplitudes. And here I'm using a, a, a notation. This is shorthand for helicity minus two, okay? Rather than writing a little minus two there, uh, people, uh, people often like to just write minus, minus. Okay, it's kind of clever. Okay, so this thing is given by 1, 2 to the power 6 over what, 2, 3 squared, 1, 3 squared. And again, just like last time for the three particle amplitudes we looked at for uh, helicity 1 and minus 1, these, this expression is non-perturbatively exact. And uh, another thing we discussed last time was dimensional analysis. So if you look at the dimensional analysis of this thing, um, we've got six powers on top, four powers of energy on bottom. So this has units of energy to the power one, uh, energy to the power two, excuse me. But it should have energy to the power one if it's supposed to be a three-point amplitude. So we need a coefficient here. Uh, coefficient with dimension one over energy. And indeed, there is a natural candidate for that coefficient and up to constants like two or pi, which I won't worry about and I can't determine using these methods, that coefficient is the square root of Newton's constant. Okay, G equals Newton's constant which is the natural uh, uh, you know, gravitational coupling. Okay, um, of course there's the parity conjugate. If you just switch all the helicities, so one plus plus, two plus plus, three minus minus, then on the right-hand side, you have to switch all the brackets from uh, uh, angle brackets to square brackets. Okay. But there's a, one more possibility. Just like for the gluon, um, you can also have 1 minus minus, 2 minus minus, 3 minus minus. And this would be 1, 2, 2, 3, one, three, all squared. And here you need some coefficient that has dimensions of energy to the power six, but this amplitude should have power energy. So the coefficient here must have a dimension one over energy to the fifth. So this is not something you would see, um, well, you could see it as a quantum correction perhaps, but you wouldn't see it, you wouldn't see it um, at tree, uh, as a tree level contribution in any, in, uh, sorry, just in Einstein-Hilbert in Einstein gravity. You would need a higher dimensional operator um, 
uh, in, in your Lagrangian with some coefficient, with some suitable coefficient, some higher curvature term, whose coefficient has dimension of one over energy to the fifth, and it could contribute to the scattering amplitude of this form. Okay, I just want to take a brief moment to look at factorization of the four particle amplitude. Well, in fact, um, yeah. This is analogous to what we did last time. Let's look at the constraints, okay? What do we know about it from what we've learned so far? Uh, it must be proportional to G. Right, because uh, it's supposed to have poles, and the residue at any pole is supposed to be a product of a three-point amplitude on the left and a three-point amplitude on the right. Uh, and those both have a, a factor of square root G in them, as we've seen. So overall, the amplitude must be proportional to G. Must have an overall factor of, and let me be specific, I need to be specific here. Let's look at one minus minus, two minus minus, three plus plus, four plus plus. Okay, then we need an overall factor to account for the little group scaling of these particles. It must have an overall factor of, of uh, one, two to the power of four times, sorry, one, yeah, that's right, three, four to the power of four to account for uh, little group scaling. Okay. Uh, so, so far, here's what we know so far. Uh, so far, we have just one undetermined function. An undeter in principle, some function of the three Mandelstam invariance. Uh, we also know crossing symmetry tells us that it should be uh, fully symmetric in S, T, U. Here there's a little subtlety again because you also have to worry about how crossing symmetry you, you, you might worry about this prefactor here uh, and how you switch a, a helicity plus two uh, state to helicity minus two if you analytically continue it from the in state to the out state. But let me not go into that detail at the moment and just claim, uh, it seems reasonable, that the effect of crossing symmetry is that this function S should be fully symmetric. Um, the next is that the function F should have dimension of one over energy to the sixth. And we can see that by looking again at this formula. This is a four particle amplitude, it should be dimensionless. We have, uh, uh, we have Newton's constant, uh, which in natural units has units of energy squared. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, we I'm sorry, uh, sorry, one over energy squared, yeah. So we have eight powers of energy here, uh, uh, negative two powers of energy from G. So overall, this is six powers of energy. So the function F should have dimensions of one over energy to the sixth. And now the last thing is, and here again, I need to resort to perturbation theory. At tree level, F must be rational with only simple poles in S, T, and U. So all these requirements together determine F equals 
some undetermined constant. Well, you can you can you can fix the constant uh, by actually looking at uh, factorization. So let me not say it's undetermined. So we've completely determined the uh, uh, we've determined the four point amplitude with almost no work. Okay, and um, you know, usually people who give talks about amplitude say, you know, if you try to compute this with Feynman diagrams, there would be dozens of Feynman diagrams, and hundreds of terms. The the gravitational Lagrangian is messy. You get a huge number of terms that all cancel in some magical way, and uh, so it's it's really neat that we were able to determine this with very little work. <coughs> um, Okay, are there any questions at this point? Because I'm gonna move on to a slightly different topic now. I'm gonna discuss recursion relations uh, for tree level amplitudes. So please don't hesitate to interrupt or to send a chat if you have a question. Okay, so now I want to describe an easy way to determine uh, tree level amplitudes in, in um, well, the application I'll have in mind is uh, for uh, Yang Mills theory or for gravity uh, masses. So the idea behind the BCFW recursion is to pick two particles. say number one and number two, and allow, uh, well, let, me, let me say deform their spinner helicity variables by a complex remember that uh, remember that we're allowing ourselves to treat uh, the spinner helicity variables as independent complex variables that lets us use the full power of complex analysis um, and uh, at the moment I'll be talking about tree level so there will be no issues about branch cuts uh, everything will just be rational functions of the spinner helicity variables So the idea is the following. Um, you, you start with your original amplitude. And then you deform it into some new uh, let me call this um, A of zero, the original amplitude. We're going to deform it in the following way. OK, I'm putting a hat on these two variables because we're going to deform them by Z. Lambda one tilde hat is going to be lambda one tilde plus Z lambda two tilde. And lambda two is going to be lambda two minus Z lambda one. Okay, now um, this has a nice feature. I mean, it's, it's a crucial feature that makes the whole thing even sensible, which is that it preserves uh, momentum conservation. Let 
let's let's look at why that's true. Every amplitude has an overall delta function of momentum conservation, which looks like this. Now, after we deform it, uh, well, let me remind you, this is equal to lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde, plus lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde, plus up to lambda n, lambda n tilde. So in going, for, you know, in going from this line to this line, I switch from thinking about it as a four vector to thinking about it as a two by two matrix but they're totally equivalent. Now, when I transform, this goes to lambda one times lambda one tilde uh, plus Z lambda two plus lambda two minus Z lambda one, lambda two tilde plus dot 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 plus lambda n lambda n tilde. And so the point is that this term, this extra term, Oops, oops, sorry, and I'm missing a tilde. This extra term here precisely cancels uh, this extra term here, minus z lambda 1 lambda 2 tilde. Okay, so you haven't messed up the momentum conservation. No, that's, that's, that's crucial because it means that um, we're still talking about a, a scattering amplitude on shell uh, sitting on the momentum conservation locus. Okay, now uh, since, and I remind you we're at tree level, amplitudes are rational functions, of these spinner helicity variables, we can use complex analysis to say that the amplitude we're interested in is given by a contour integral of this form. So why does this work? Let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at the complex Z plane. Okay. And now let's look, um, this quantity here, A of Z over Z, has poles. Certainly it has a pole here. Has a pole uh, here with residue A naught. That's the amplitude we're interested in computing. But um, there might be other poles, who knows where. There will only be a finite number because this is a rational function. Um, so all these things are other poles. Okay. And if we choose some contour, let me get a different color. If we choose a contour that circles the origin um, and encloses only the origin and not any of the other poles, then, and here's the important caveat, if A of Z goes to zero as Z goes to infinity, then, there is no pole at infinity, so we can uh, push the contour out yeah, I didn't say so so far this 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 is just an identity from from complex analysis that um if, if we make our contour here small enough so that it only encircles the pole at the origin, then the only contribution we'll get is the residue of that pole, which is A0. Okay, now I want to do a contour deformation. I want to take this little contour and push it out to infinity. 
And along the way, I will pick up all the other residues. And as long as there is no pole at infinity, we can push the contour out. And we find the following expression that a of zero is equal to minus the sum over other poles Let, let me let me call them z i okay now um, so if you did have a pole at infinity then there would be plus an additional boundary term here. But um, it was proven by BCFW uh, that um, pure Yang Mills theory and pure um, Einstein Hilbert. gravity have the property uh, that a of z goes to zero as z goes to infinity. So there is no boundary term. Of course, there have been plenty of papers written about other theories where sometimes you do have boundary terms and you can set up some partial recursions for those boundary terms. But in the simplest application of this recursion, uh, there is no boundary term. Oh, I, I skipped ahead. Why did I even call it a recursion? Okay, you look at this formula and you say, okay, what good is this formula? Who, who, who needs this formula? Um, so let's explain why this is a recursion. Okay, well, um, we just have to ask where, where are the poles? And we discussed last time that uh, at tree level, you know where the poles are because of factorizations. The poles happen when you have a collection In other words, when the amplitude splits, and you have uh, some collection of particles, oops, containing one. And over here, you have a, uh, the complementary uh, set. Uh, uh, let's call this set I. And then the total momentum uh, flowing in the loop here PI is going to be the sum of momenta in set I. Okay, so just by momentum conservation, uh, I, I happen to be choosing the convention where um, all my momenta are outgoing. So by momentum conservation, um, the momentum that's flowing uh, through this uh, internal line here has PI. So the point is the following, that there are many different factorization channels that you could possibly look at. But their special ones happen when particles one and two are separated, like here. Because what happens then is that this PI 
turns into a function of z. Right, it turns into a function of z in the deformed amplitude because we've shifted momentum of particle one. Right, as I showed a few moments ago, p1 plus p2 is unchanged by the shift. But each of p1 and p2 separately is changed. So as long as you're looking at a factorization channel where one and two are separated from each other, then the momentum here flowing in the internal channel is going to be a function of z. So there will be some value of z. Let me write that. There will be some value of z. Call it z sub i such that pi squared of zi is equal to zero. So the amplitude a of z has a pole at zi whose residue is uh, a left zi times a right of zi. Okay, so this obviously is the, the left amplitude, and this here is the right amplitude. Okay, I need to be just a tiny bit more precise here. Um, we could work it out. Um, uh, pi of z is equal to pi of zero plus z uh, lambda one lambda two tilde. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Let's check if that's right. That's that's how much the shifted. That's how much uh, momentum p one is shifted by z times lambda one lambda two tilde. Okay, so pi squared of z squared is equal to pi squared of zero plus uh, z times uh, pi of zero dot lambda one lambda two tilde. Now, uh, oh sorry, uh, there should be a two here. I'm just taking this first line and squaring it. Now the third term here squares to zero. This is because this is a null vector. Okay, so that's that's another. I didn't mention that before, but it's really a crucial fact. You're taking you're taking p one and shifting it by a null vector. Um, it's a null vector. It's manifestly a null vector because I've written it as a product of two spinner helicity variables. So. Thinking about it as a two by two matrix, it obviously has determinant zero. Um, then there's a there's a nice notation. Um, remember a moment ago I was discussing these fancy bracket uh, products. Um, there's a notation here. Uh, this thing is z times one pi two. Okay, so I use this equation to define this notation. You think about PI as a two by two matrix, and you use the epsilon tensor to contract the alpha dot index of that. You think of PI as a two by two matrix, you use the epsilon tensor to contract the dotted index of that two by two matrix with lambda two tilde, and you use the epsilon tensor to contract the undotted index with lambda one. Okay, so what we find is that, um, oh, and this should be z, uh, okay, yeah, the value of z that makes this zero is zi is negative pi squared 
over oops okay if you start really getting into these exercises you become very quick with manipulating these symbols as I already mentioned before but I just wanted to I want to do this uh, only for one purpose because the residue we need is not the residue of A of Z, but, um, but the residue of A of Z over Z. Okay, so A of Z over Z looks like, as I've already said, we know we have this overall factor of one over Z, and then we know from tree level factorization Okay, this is what we know from tree level factorization. Tree level factorization. So to continue this, uh, this is equal to one over Z times A left times A right over uh, uh, P I of zero squared um, hold on just a second I think there's a sign error in my notes okay yeah oh yeah I, I, I know what happened here to the Hold on, I'm just trying to get some sign consistency here. Yeah, I okay, For, there are two things here. First of all, I forgot the two here. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, and then um, there's actually a minus sign in the definition here. Uh, because of the way the epsilon uh, so I'm implicitly using this formula to define what I mean by this symbol here. And uh, the standard definition has a minus sign there. Okay, so this is actually pi squared minus two z times one pi uh, uh, two. Okay, and now here's a short exercise, check that the residue at z equals x over 2y of the quantity 1 over z times f over x minus 2zy. You see what I'm doing here? Just for simplicity, I'm calling this f. I'm calling this x. And I'm calling this y. Okay. You can check that the residue of this is equal to minus 1 over x. Therefore, we have. Now let's go back up to our formula here a few moments ago. This, this formula here, uh, there's a minus sign here. That's gonna nicely cancel the minus sign here. And when we calculate that residue, well, that's what we've done here in this last step. So the minus signs cancel out and we find A of zero is equal to the sum over uh, sets i that contain particle one but not particle two
of um, a left times a right. Okay, now, now I'm done. This is the main formula. Okay, now the crucial thing about this formula is the right-hand side only involves unshifted amplitudes. So it is a recursion, right? If you want to calculate the 18 particle amplitude, you can calculate it recursively uh, by using uh, amplitudes with smaller number of particles. Um, now, one of the interesting things about this is that it's really weird that the sum uh, only runs over sets of factorization channels where particles one and particles let particle one and particle two are separated from each other. You might ask the question, wait a minute, something smells wrong about that. Certainly, uh, if I take an n particle amplitude, certainly it does have, let's say I take a four particle amplitude, one, two, three, four. Certainly there should be a pole where particle one and particle two are on one side and particle three and particle four are on the other. There should be an S-channel pole, right? That, 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 that's an allowed Feynman diagram. So the remarkable thing that this formula is telling you is that any such pole, certainly it's there, but it's redundant in a sense. It's secretly already included uh, when you sum up all of these terms. So the, this recursion sort of gives you a small, a, tells you that you can recover the full amplitude, including all of its poles, just by summing over a certain particular restricted subset of factorization channels, which is really quite remarkable. Sorry, Mark? Yeah. Uh, did I miss something? Uh, you mean the A left and A right, uh, you don't need to make shift? Oh. I'm sorry, thank you, yes, thank you for correcting my error. They're, yeah, they're still valid amplitudes because they're on shell. Right. Yeah, good, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Ooh. Okay, this is definitely zero down here because mm -hmm. uh, if, I put a ZI, if I put a ZI here, that would be a zero in the denominator. So yeah, thank you, okay. Yeah, sorry, we, we took the residue at ZI. Um, so that should definitely be a ZI there in the numerator. And I guess you mean on shell rather than on shift. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you, Son. Yeah. So if you have a database of uh, on shell amplitudes up to n, n particles, you can then start uh, using this recursion to bootstrap your way to higher uh, amplitudes. Okay. Um, I really urge you, this takes me beyond the scope of my lectures, but I urge you to try some examples. Um, For example, use the recursion to compute, okay. uh, for example, uh, which examples are one minus two minus. Uh, using In this case, the only uh, factorization you need okay, one and two have to be separated from each other. Uh, um, well, let, let me refer you, yeah. 
I'm just going to write the answer here. Um, you can find all the details, for example, in the book by Elvang and Huang or many other references. Um, but remarkably, you'll find the answer. Oops. Okay. More generally, you can check that uh, the tree level amplitude for uh, n gluons, that is massless spin one particles, uh, in the uh, so-called MHV helicity configuration. I'll explain this notation in a second. Is, okay. So, the word MHV stands for maximally helicity violating, and that's a configuration where you have N minus two positive helicity gluons and two negative helicity gluons. And it's, uh, it's particularly simple to solve the recursion for this class of amplitudes, because you can easily check that it's closed, it's a subclass that's closed under the recursion. Um, basically, each possible non trivial factorization only involves adding an additional three point amplitude to an n minus one point amplitude. So you can just solve this, the n particle amplitude, in one go. Um, Well, okay, yeah, if you do it right, okay. Um, this is given by ij to the power four over the uh, cyclic product. This is called the Park-Taylor formula. I hedged myself uh, there a second because when you do the BCFW recursion, uh, you always have a choice at each stage in the game, at each step in the recursion, right? Go, go, go all the way back to the beginning. I chose particles one and two completely at random. Uh, uh, you can choose any two particles to, to be the two that you shift when you do the recursion, okay? And different choices are, are, uh, are, are more or less suitable for certain calculations. Um, um, yeah, this is a general formula that's valid when I and J are in general position here. But, uh, okay, it's, it's easiest to do the recursion when they're next to each other, but uh, at least in the planar language, which I haven't described yet. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question. The reason, uh, 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 can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's asked before because my internet just got disconnected. Uh, but uh, so from this recursion relation, it seems like you could uh, build up any higher uh, particle amplitude from uh, sort of building blocks of lower point amplitudes. But suppose in the process there is a contact term, uh, how do you sort of account for that? I mean, because this is completely non perturbative in, in, in that sense. I'm guessing. Well, no. Um, so certainly, um, certainly, this recursion is not non-perturbatively valid. In fact, um, the derivation explicitly used the fact that the only kinds of singular. When I did this contour deformation, I explicitly used the fact that I only expected to get uh, poles, as right. opposed to right. So this is definitely. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, there is an analogous kind of recursion that you can do for loop level integrands, but that's way beyond the scope of my, uh, so that's partially answers your question. Now, even, even contact terms that you can have at tree level, well, indeed, ge generically, those would spoil the recursion because those would spoil the property. Remember, the crucial property is that the recursion is only valid if there's no term at, boundary term at infinity. Right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, and then there's a question. Um, uh, uh, there's a question in the chat that's somewhat related to that uh, about uh, do you have to worry about being on multiple sheets? And indeed, uh, no, because at this level, everything is at tree level. So we're only talking about rational functions. So there's no need to worry about uh, analytic continuation to higher sheets or anything like that. Okay. Good. Now I want to uh, move on uh, to say a word about supersymmetry. Okay. Um, at tree level, gluon amplitudes. are insensitive to uh, Susie. And what I, mean, what I mean by that is if you have any tree level, I mean, it's clear at the level of Feynman diagrams, if you have any tree level uh, gluon amplitude, um, you can only have gluons participating in the diagram. None of these internal lines can possibly be anything you can't uh, you know you can only create let's say you had a let's say you had a supersymmetric theory where you also had gluinos or even scalars um, those always have to be produced in pairs okay so there would be no treat you would certainly have loop diagrams uh, that involve them but at tree level there's no diagram you can draw that would involve any of those super partners so the upshot is that the tree level scattering amplitudes in any Yang Mills theory, I mean, even the, the gluon tree level amplitudes in QCD are exactly the same as they are uh, in a theory with supersymmetry. So we might as well use the maximal amount of supersymmetry uh, that's allowed. So we might as well uh, use the maximal, that is n equals four, uh, supersymmetry. And this is a multiplet um, where you have, uh, you have a positive helicity gluon, you have a negative helicity gluon, and then you have a collection of states of intermediate helicity. So there's one gluon, there's four gluinos, gluinos with helicity plus a half, there's six scalar fields, uh, four gluinos with helicity minus a half, and then of course there's one negative helicity gluon. So altogether, it's a multiplet with 16 states. Okay. So a notational device uh, to handle the bookkeeping Bookkeeping is a great word. I think it might be the only word in the English language that has three consecutive pairs of doubled letters. But anyway, uh, uh, a, na uh, a natural way to handle the bookkeeping um, is to introduce Grassmann variables uh, that look like this. 
Uh, let me just like this. So we have a collection of four Grassmann variables for every particle. Um, and then, so recall that functions of a, of a Grassmann variable terminate. They, they have a Taylor series expansion that terminates, that functions um, of such variables have a finite Taylor series. For example, if you, if you just have a single Grassmann variable, and you do its Taylor series expansion, um, it would only have two terms. The next term is zero because uh, eta squared is zero. Okay. So uh, we can uh, encode all of the different uh, individual component amplitudes in a super amplitude using a Grassmann expansion. So the way that works is we define a super amplitude. In the following way. And I'll try to use a, a, a curly uh, a curly A. And the way to think about this is think about this as a Taylor series expansion in all of the, uh, I'll just write Taylor series expansion in the uh, 4N Grassman variables. So let me start writing some terms. It's going to be uh, the first term, the term with no fermions, is going to be the amplitude with all positive helicity gluons. Uh, in fact, this is zero. But let, let me come back in a minute to why it's zero. Uh, here I'm just indicating that is the first term in the Taylor series expansion. The next term in the Taylor series expansion would be the terms with a single fermion. So we would have something like, okay, there are uh, there are four different there are four n different fermions. So what we would have here is the amplitude. where all particles are positive helicity gluons, except one of the particles has been lowered uh, down the multiplet by one step. So particle I here would not be a positive helicity gluon. It would be um, uh, uh, I would be not positive helicity gluon, but uh, H equals plus one half Gluino. Oops. Okay. So then, I, I, I hope it's becoming clear at this point. You 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 ex you write out the full uh, fermionic Taylor series expansion, and every time uh, you have some Grassmann variable out front here the coefficient of that term in this Taylor series expansion is the corresponding amplitude where you've lowered that particle one unit down from the multiplet. So this goes, down, this goes on for a long, long time until you reach the very last term. The very last term in the Taylor series expansion will be the term that has all the fermions in it, all four N of them. So this will be the product, uh, I equals one to N times the product, A equals uh, one to four, a to i a, times the amplitude with all. Now at this point, you've lowered all the way down to the bottom of the multiplet for all particles. This is again zero, but we'll get it to wide zero in a second. 
in principle, this is the last term of the Taylor series expansion. So this is what a super amplitude looks like. Um, altogether, there are uh, 16 to the n terms, but many of them may be zero. I'm just saying that in general, uh, that's how many terms you get. Okay, now, um, how can we make supersymmetry manifest? Well, to that end, you have to look at the supersymmetry generators. Remember that uh, the momentum generators, I mean, momentum is given by lambda lambda uh, tilde, as we saw a long time ago. If you look at the supersymmetry generators, there are two types of supersymmetry generators. There are the Qs, oops, that may be more consistent. Okay, there are eight of these because the index alpha runs over one and two, and the index capital A runs over one to four. So there are eight of these Qs, and then there are eight Q bars. Notice that, that this way of treating the supersymmetry, you have to make a choice where the lambdas and the lambda tildes um, are treated differently. And that goes all the way back to our choice here. Um, uh, you know, you have to choose who's at the top of the multiplet and who's at the bottom of the multiplet, the positive felicity gluon or the negative felicity gluon. And so making a choice necessarily breaks the parity symmetry and tells you that one of your, either your Q or your Q bar will be associated with the derivative operator and the other one will be associated with a, um, multiplication operator. Anyway, to make a long story short, the reason I'm mentioning this is the following. Uh, momentum, trans momentum conservation is made manifest by an overall factor of the uh, momentum in each amplitude. Okay, we know that uh, moment that uh, uh, translation symmetry uh, is reflected at the level of amplitudes by the fact that every amplitude has this momentum conserving delta function in it. Similarly, The Q supersymmetry invariance can be made manifest by uh, uh, demanding that every amplitude has a factor of delta eight of, uh, oops, sorry, that's an alpha, not an A. Okay, um, a couple things. Uh, recall here, for a fermion, a delta function of a fermion is just the fermion itself. Okay, so here, um, 
this is a sort of an eight dimensional fermionic delta function because the alpha index takes two values, the A index takes four values, and the, 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 the meat, the, the, the thing inside the delta function is sort of, is the total super momentum. So here I've got the sum over all n particles times the, just like here, in the momentum conserving delta function, I have the total momentum being the sum of the momenta of the individual particles. Here I have the total super momentum. Okay, so interestingly, um, note this implies that the uh, Taylor expansion of any super amplitude uh, is zero until you reach terms of order fermion to the eighth. You see, we're saying that uh, just the consideration of the Q supersymmetry tells us that every amplitude should have this super momentum conserving delta function in it. And this thing is clearly some long polynomial. Uh, so this has to be a factor sitting in front of every super amplitude. And this is an eighth degree polynomial in the fermions. So that means if we refer back to our Taylor series expansion of the super amplitude here, all the, the, the first few terms, this term here, this term here, et cetera, all the way until we get to eighth order in the fermions, those all have to be zero. Um, so that explains why the first, this is one way of understanding, there are other ways, of course, this is one way of understanding why sort of the first non-zero amplitude is not the one with all positive helicity gluons or all but one positive helicity gluon. The first non-zero amplitude is the one where all of them have positive helicity except two. Because to go from positive helicity to negative helicity, you come down uh, four steps in the multiplet. Um, uh, and that means you have four powers of fermions. You need a total of eight powers of fermions. So you need to take two particles from positive helicity down to negative helicity. Okay. Um, there is a there is a there are two caveats here. Uh, so one thing I should mention is that um, the three particle MHV uh, super amplitude um, I'll just write it like that. That's our fermionic moment, super momentum conserving delta function. This looks like uh, this. Um, but there is also due to the special features of three particle kinematics. Last time we saw that there are some unusual features of three particle massless kinematics. Uh, there is something, an allowed uh, MHV bar super amplitude. And it takes the following form. It only has a four dimensional fermionic delta function. divided by this numerator. And I'll just leave it as an exercise. 
it's a, it's a really simple exercise, but it involves free particle kinematics. Check that this is annihilated. by Q. Okay. Uh, that was comment number one. Uh, comment number two is um, this way of, of making the supersymmetry manifest, as I emphasized a while ago, only makes half of the supersymmetry manifest, the Q supersymmetry. What about the Q bar supersymmetry? Well, that's a much more complicated beast, um, especially when you go to loop level and have to worry about uh, anomalies due to the regularization of infrared divergences. And uh, Song He, who's listening in, has made quite a career of understanding uh, the implications, the very powerful implications of the Q-bar supersymmetry for scattering amplitudes. Uh, but unfortunately, um, that would go well beyond the scope of my lectures, so I won't say more about it, except to note here that Q bar super, supersymmetry places additional very powerful constraints on amplitudes. Okay. All right, so in my last half hour, I want to switch gears just a little bit. Uh, again, don't hesitate to uh, let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, may I ask you a question? Absolutely. Yeah, in the MHB supersymmetric amplitude, instead of having a two negative helicity gluons, could you have other component amplitudes with scalars? Uh, because Absolutely. So let's, let's, look, let's, look, uh, uh, let's look at the possibility. Oh. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Let's look at uh, let's look at MHV uh, three point amplitude. That are non zero. Okay. So he here's an easy way to just do this in your head. Uh, we start with this one that's non zero. Okay. Now. All of the other uh, amplitudes uh, sort of in the same uh, uh, multiple, in the, not in the multiple is a bad word, but with the same total, let's look at all of the amplitudes. Uh, let's look at other amplitudes with the same total helicity. In this case, minus one. Because the total helicity of an amplitude is related to, uh, you know, uh, what degree. So, the, for example, these will all be terms that are eighth order in the fermions. It'll be clear what I mean by that in a second. So one thing we could do, for example, we could look at Instead of having a negative helicity gluon for particle one, we could raise its helicity by a half, and we could lower particle three by a half. Okay, so here, this amplitude that I've just written, this is again a component of the super amplitude that's eighth order in the fermionic variables. Okay, and there are other things you can do as well. You could you could go further. You could uh, you could have this be. Um, you could have this be one of the scalar particles by raising it to helicity zero um, and lowering this to a scalar particle. So an amplitude of two scalars and a negative helicity gluon um, is in the same collection of amplitudes related to each other in a very simple way uh, because of supersymmetry. So and I'll just write here, etc. Does, does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so what is the property of uh, like a, being a MHV amplitude in the supersymmetric? Like thank a, you. I, yeah. It, thank you. Yeah. I I, sh I was literally about to write that, and and I, I I I I in my head I skipped it for lack of time, but it was a mistake. So I'll just write. Uh, in general, 
the n particle super amplitude in uh, n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory has the form by convention we strip out uh, an overall factor that's given by the Park Taylor formula then the first term here is just going to be 1 and now uh, this, so this is what we call, okay, and this is what we call the MHV super amplitude. I mean, when, when you include the prefactor. Then here, after the plus, you, you have higher order terms in the fermions. You might think there's a term with nine fermions in the Taylor series expansion and then 10 fermions, 11 fermions, and 12 fermions. In fact, due to R symmetry, I haven't mentioned that yet, uh, you only get terms with uh, powers of fermions that are multiples of four. And the reason is that the indices of the fermions must be contracted uh, by the uh, invariant tensor of SU4, which is epsilon A, B, C, D. So you can't make an SU4 invariant with less than four fermions. So the point here is the next non-zero term in this Taylor series expansion has, in fact, 12 fermions. The, the eight that are sitting out front and then four more. Then the next term has 16 fermions, et cetera. And these things are given the names um, This times this is called the NMHV superamplitude. Uh, and you can see where I'm going, though I'm running out of space. Well, some authors might some authors might refer to, I mean, any individual paper you read on this subject should hopefully be clear about whether they've factored out the Park Taylor factor completely or whether they, in their minds, still have it sitting here. Um, but this, this would be the n squared MHV super amplitude. Etc. cetera. Um, so that's what we mean. Um, so back up here, when I was doing this exercise, all of these were different components that appear in the MHV super amplitude, meaning they're all, uh, uh, degree eight in fermions. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, good. All right, I wanna talk now uh, about momentum twisters. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, it is related to the previous point where you said that if you have a contact term, uh, you will have a, a contribution from infinity. Uh, but you also said that uh, for uh, Yang Mills and uh, uh, Einstein Hilbert, there is no uh, uh, contribution from infinity. But from the Lagrangian, it does seem like there are uh, uh, contact terms, uh, like four points. I'm, so. Yeah, thank you. I was, um, uh, I was perhaps misinterpreting your question slightly. Um, Certainly, uh, uh, when I heard the word contact term, I, I think I miss I, I had in my mind, uh, for example, like uh, polynomial terms in the amplitude that don't have any poles. But what you're referring to clearly with your clarification is uh, like contact terms in the Lagrangian, like a, an actual four-point interaction that you like A to the fourth term. 
that, that right. you have in the right. game. Absolutely. Sure, sure. You certainly have those kinds of terms in the Lagrangian. But the remarkable thing is when you, when you sit down and add up all the Feynman diagrams, let's say for, even for pure Yang-Mills theory, yes, there's a, there's a four gluon contact interaction, but when you add up all the Feynman diagrams, magic happens. There's a lot of cancellation, and, and, and uh, you don't get such polynomial terms. So, for example, the, you know, going back to this formula here, uh, the Park-Taylor formula, um, certainly if you wanted to derive this formula using Feynman diagrams, you would get the wrong answer if you forgot to include the, the four-point uh, gluon vertex. But remarkably, all the, everything adds up and you only get this term exactly. There's no plus polynomial piece. So th does that clarify your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is, is there a quick, I mean, is there a very simple reason to understand why or is it detailed? Ah, well, uh, um, I, I, hope, I hope that my, my uh, deviation through supersymmetry provides maybe the quickest way to understand it, that uh, at, at tree level, uh, the amplitudes are insensitive to supersymmetry, so we might as well use n equals 4 supersymmetry. Um, uh, and uh, this is the the first non-zero amplitude, um, and and oh oh I'm sorry I'm sorry I, I'm sorry I get you're asking is there a quick way to see that the quick the mm, well the quickest way to see this formula is to show that it satisfies the recursion relation, but the, the but but that that's putting the cart before the horse because. I haven't proven that the amplitude behaves well at d equals infinity. So I'll just refer you to the argument from the original BCFW paper. It's a very, it's a very quick argument involving how polarization vectors and momenta scale as z goes to infinity. But that is an additional input you need here. Um, oh, and just to clarify once again, because I think I may have contributed to some confusion, the statement about checking uh, the behavior at z equals infinity that's a statement that you have to check at the level of amplitudes. You can't check it at, at, at the level of, uh, I mean, it's not enough. So for example, a contact interaction in the Lagrangian, that single contact term by itself might violate the scaling you need at large Z, but it's irrelevant to this argument because the, the argument requires you to know about the large Z behavior of amplitudes, not diagrams individually. I, okay, okay. Okay. Um, ah, then there's a question. Uh, what is the underlying theory for H equals two uh, amplitudes? How do we know it is Einstein-Hilbert? Well, we just rely on the fact that, um, uh, you know, in, in, the amplitude, in the amplitude approach, there's basically a unique uh, set of amplitudes we can write down for a, a, you know, a, minimal, a minimal set of amplitudes describing uh, particle, massless particles of spin two, and we get what we get. And then on the other hand, the Einstein-Hilbert action is sort of a minimal action that gives you amplitudes. Uh, so so neither side has any, has any adjustable, you know, if, if, if we say we turn off the coefficient of any possible higher dimensional operators, which we know how to do on both sides, then there's no wiggle room really on either side. So they have to be, they have to agree with each other. I mean, of course you can do more explicit checks, um, but, uh, but in a nutshell, that's why it has to work. Okay, so uh, I want to introduce momentum twisters because you might well see them in other talks. And uh, the reason for doing this is that um, uh, uh, we have seen that writing P equals lambda lambda tilde trivializes the P squared equals zero constraint. But amplitudes are still subject 
to a nonlinear constraint uh, sum of lambda lambda tilde must equal zero by momentum conservation. Okay. So we'd like to switch to a new set of variables that trivializes this constraint as well. And we will see that that new set of variables also has a nice additional property of making symmetries more manifest. Okay, also, um, uh, yeah, so let me just go to the, to the uh, punchline. Let's consider what are called dual variables. or region momenta. So what this means is Okay. If I choose some so basically the idea is the following picture. We're considering an n particle scattering amplitude so we have n null momenta. Imagine drawing them back to back so this is P1. Now these vectors live, these are, each one is a null vector in three plus one dimensional Minkowski space. Obviously I can't draw it that way. So I'm just drawing it here uh, on a flat two dimensional surface. But you imagine putting them back to back and because they sum to zero, you know that you're gonna come back where you started from at the end of this process. Uh, then what I'm going to do is uh, give a name to each one of these vertices. Okay. And, uh, right. Oops. Okay, and somehow, yeah, there, there are different conventions in the literature, and um, I see that mm -hmm. I have, my picture is, differently oriented from my uh, choice here. So let me, okay, it's kind of dangerous to switch here on the fly, but let me at least make my equations consistent with my picture. Okay, so given a collection of PI, the x's are not uniquely determined because we can take this whole picture and make an arbitrary translation of it because we can uh, arbitrarily translate in x space. But the point is that sum of pi zero is automatic if we uh, choose to parameterize pi is xi plus one minus xi. Uh, with, I hope this was clear, but it understood that uh, this is the crucial point. These indices should be understood cyclically. I'll have more to say about that later because this is an important point and I haven't yet really introduced any notion of cyclicity. Um, uh, of course, when you're talking about gluon amplitudes, there's a natural way to associate a cyclic structure because of the uh, because of the coming from the uh, coming from the uh, color factors. Okay. So what I want to do now is take this equation. So I have this equation: pi is xi plus one minus xi, and now I want to do is contract both sides. with the spinner helicity variable lambda i beta. And what that means, 
So let me put the indices back here. I'm thinking about this as the two by two matrix. And so I'm thinking about each of these as a two by two matrix. Let me call it alpha, beta, dot, alpha, beta, dot, alpha, beta, dot. And I want to contract both sides with uh, lambda i uh, beta. And as always, when I use the word contract, uh, the indices for SU2 left and SU2 right are contracted with the epsilon symbol. Okay, so that means, for example, um, to be absolutely specific, that would mean epsilon alpha beta pi alpha beta dot lambda i beta equals blah, 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 blah. Okay, uh, that's what I mean by contracting. But in order to save, uh, in order to make notation, to, to simplify notation, what I'm going to do is uh, just use a shorthand that you'll see in a second. Now, first of all, this is equal to zero, right? Because this, this creature here is lambda i alpha, lambda tilde uh, uh, i beta dot. And now this is clearly zero because I have an, eps an anti-symmetric epsilon tensor that's attached to these two objects. Okay, so this is equal to zero, manifestly. But on the right-hand side, and here's where you're going to see my, my condensed notation, I have x i plus 1 uh, lambda i. This object now, once all the indices are contracted, has a free uh, beta dot index. Okay, so I'm just introducing some notational shorthand here in order to, uh, it's, I hope it's clear what's going on. X is a two by two matrix and it's hitting that two component uh, spinner helicity variable lambda. So what you're left with again is a two component object, but now it has a, a right, the remaining index of that two component object is a dotted index. It belongs to the SU2 right subgroup of the Lorentz uh, algebra. Okay, so what we learned is that these two things are equal to each other. So um, that sounds important. Let's give this a name. So let's call this thing mu i. I'll raise the index now. Uh, indices are always raised and lowered with the epsilon symbol, as we've discussed. Okay, so that's the definition. This is the definition of mu. Okay, and then what we're going to do is then let's assemble the two lambdas and the two mu's into a single four component object. Okay, now here I need my usual caveat. This is not an I, this is one dot, okay? This is two dot, okay? Uh, and here, this capital, this lowercase I, I remind you, runs over the n particles. And this runs over the four components of this four component object. Now, the reason it's natural to define um, uh, or to assemble these four, these four objects into a single thing is that if we look at the scaling, remember that the little group scaling involved us taking lambda and lambda tilde to one over t lambda and t times lambda tilde. Now, if we go back and look, Obviously, as we know, that leaves uh, the momentum P unchanged. Therefore, it leaves X unchanged. And if we look back at this definition, we'll see that rescaling lambda by a factor of 1 over T means that mu also gets rescaled by a factor of 1 over T. Evidently, 
transforms mu in the same way as lambda. So all four components of z transform homogeneously. So therefore, z i, capital I, is properly understood as an element of projective space. Projective space P3. Or a point, po I should say, let me, a point in projective space. So uh, projective space P3 means the set of, uh, the set of four component uh, coordinates or objects, if you will, subject to the relation um, that this is identified with TA1, TA2, TA3, TA4 for any non-zero uh, number T. And we might as well, as I've discussed several times, we might as well allow all of these variables to be complex because it's always useful to, cons to consider complexified kinematics so that we have the full power of complex analysis to bear. Um, okay, so what we've seen so far is that if you give me a collection of, of uh, null momenta that add up to zero and you specify a cyclic ordering of them, I can naturally use that information to construct a collection of n points in projective space P3. So I'll summarize that here. So a uh, collection of Pi satisfying sum of Pi equals zero allows me to define a collection of n points in P3. Now I just want to quickly go the other way. What I'm working towards, of course, is an understanding that the kinematic data is exactly equivalent to specifying endpoints in P3. So suppose you give me endpoints in P3. I want to ask the question, can I reconstruct from that data can I reconstruct the original picture where I have n light-like separated points in Minkowski space? And yes, you can, because what you do is consider the four equations Okay, so you've given me you've given me the lambdas and the mu's. And then I'm going to make four equations. They're the equations we've seen before. Uh, I want to switch to I minus one here. Okay. See, I'm, I'm doing something a little bit tricky here. Um, uh, in this set of equations called the incidence relations, you see that I have xi and xi plus 1. Both of them appear in the equation involving mu i. But if you give me the full collection of them, I want to ask the question in the other way. I want to set up an equa a set of equations where I have xi in in both sets of equations. And so therefore, I have uh, one of them is going to be the i equation, and one of them is going to be the i minus one equation. One of the i equations and one of the i minus one equations. Anyway, there are two of these because alpha dot takes two values, and there are two of these because alpha dot takes two. So this is a collection 
of four equations, okay, for the four uh, components of Xi. Remember, you can think about Xi either as a two by two matrix or equivalently as a four component vector. Anyway, it has four degrees of freedom. Here are four equations that for general kinematics will allow you to solve for those Xi. And the point is, and then note that by construction, they will satisfy zero is equal to xi minus xi plus one. Uh, I'll put the indices here to be uh, very precise, okay? They annihilate, see, if you look at the equations, if you look at the set of equations that they were designed to satisfy or that they were determined from, they by construction satisfy these incidence relations again. Okay, so they give zero when you act on lambda. Okay, so this is a two by two matrix. And this is a, think about this as a two component vector. So if you've got a two by two matrix that has a null vector, that is a, a vector that gives zero when you, you, when you hit that vector with your matrix. That's what this equation is telling us. We have a two by two matrix and there exists a vector lambda such that when we act on that vector with our two by two matrix, we get zero. That's called a null vector. That means that the two by two matrix can't have full rank. It must have less than maximal rank in particular, in this case, it must, it, well, in particular, in any case, it must have determinant zero. Therefore, determinant of xi minus xi plus one is zero, which means that xi and xi plus one are null separated. So the basic picture here is that our kinematic space which is parameterized by a collection of n null momenta that uh, form a closed polygon when you uh, draw them back to back is completely equivalent to, in other words, specifying this data is exactly equivalent to specifying the data of n completely arbitrary points in P3. Okay, and then, so the idea is, you tell me these endpoints in P3, um, and I can work backwards from that using the construction I've given, uh, the original data. Okay, so the, the, in a very real sense here, the lines between consecutive points in this picture correspond to the vertices here. Okay, okay, so the zi are called momentum twisters. Okay, and just as my very last sentence, because I know my time is coming to an end, they are particularly useful I mean, their their showcase, uh, uh, you know, their the example where they their power shines uh, in n equals four super Yang Mills theory, which has a remarkable symmetry. called uh, dual conformal invariance. Actually, dual super conformal invariance. Um, okay, 
And what this means uh, is basically conformal invariance in X space. And now there's an unfortunate ambiguity here because just because of the historical usage of the notation here. When I write X here, I mean the dual variable, the dual, the dual space to momentum. Not in the sense of Fourier transform, okay? Not, usually we're used to thinking of momentum space and position space as dual to each other in the sense of, uh, in the sense of Fourier transform. That's not what I mean here. I mean going back to this equation here, I mean uh, basically dual in the graph theory sense, um, dual in this sense. So N equals four super Yang Mills theory has a remarkable conformal symmetry that acts on these X variables. Um, and uh, so the upshot is that, uh, just to summarize in my very last slide, um, uh, it, let, let me, the, 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 the easiest way to explain clearly how to think about this is the following. Let's ask the question, what, is the dimension of the kinematic space of n equals four super yang mills. So if you think about it, um, and let's do the counting in two different ways. Let's do it in the naive way, and then let's do it using dual, uh, let's do it using momentum twisters. In na naive counting, you would say you have n massless particles. Okay, so each particle is specified by uh, a, a, um, a null momenta. So we have three N degrees of freedom. For N null momenta. Then we have minus 10 because of the constraints of Poincare invariance. Right, uh, the, the Poincaré group has 10 generators, four translations that imply overall conservation of energy and momentum, and then you have three boost generators and three rotations, altogether 10 generators. Then, in the special case of N equals four super Yang Mills theory, there are an additional five remarkable generators, and these are uh, four uh, translations in X space, and um, uh, uh, one, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the best way to think about this, um, you have the dilatation in X space, and then uh, you have the super, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, special, I'm trying, the word I'm reaching for is special conformal transformations. These are the transformations that are generated infinitesimally by a translation followed by an inversion in X space. Uh, uh, sorry, inversion, translation, inversion. So altogether, we find that the uh, kinematic space is 3n minus 15 dimension. Now, this symmetry is simply is, is easy to realize at the level of momentum twisters, how to get this counting. And the way to do it is the following. I won't show in detail, because I don't have time, how to see that precisely the generators match up one to one, although it's a fairly simple exercise. I, I, uh, I've done it in other lectures. Um, what you do is you assemble the uh, momentum twister variables into a four by n matrix.
So each of the momentum twisters is a four component object. Uh, so I've, I've written each one as a column of this four by four n, uh, four by n matrix. And then what you do is you mod out and then uh, the set of symmetry transformations That is uh, these things here. I'll put a star here to remind you that I'm referring back up at here. Corresponds to left multiplication um, uh, by. SL4 on the above four by n matrix. Okay, therefore, uh, you'll usually see amplitudes in n equals four written. Uh, in terms of the uh, SL, sorry, can't write today, the SL4 invariant inner product uh, I, J, K, L. So remember when we, when we talked about the spinner helicity variables, we had a natural two bracket. Here we have these four component uh, momentum twister variables. So the natural object is the four bracket. Or in other words, this is the determinant of the four by four minor that you get if you place the four selected momentum twisters into a matrix as such. Okay, so I'm a little bit over time and I'm gonna to have to stop here, but my goal was at least to get to you to this stage so that if you see other talks on N equals four super Yang Mills theory and you see people talking about momentum twisters and writing four brackets everywhere, and you'll, at least you'll have some idea uh, what they're talking about. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention um, and I'm definitely open to any number of questions at this point. Uh, I have a question. So, in when you wrote uh, du uh, dual super conformal invariance, what did yes. you mean by super? Because uh, uh, yes. in this you have you only have fifteen parameters. It seems like yeah. So uh, I just yeah. For lack of time, I didn't uh, I didn't discuss the uh, there's an ana there's an analogous construction you can do involving the um, the Grassmann variables. Let me just sketch it in in like less than one minute. Okay. You can also uh, you can also introduce uh, lambda i eta i as being theta i minus theta i plus one analog to p i equals and I think because because I on the fly switched conventions here in the lecture, which is always a dangerous thing to do. Um, So, so the point is you can define an analog of dual variables for these fermions. Um, and then you'll find that there's a, there's a supersymmetric analog. Uh, the, the Q and Q bar SUSY generators um, uh, uh, are joined. I referenced those above a few minutes ago by uh, partners S and S bar that I won't, I won't discuss any further except to say that, that the, 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 the conformal group in X space actually is a whole super conformal group. And together you get this giant group, actually together all of these generators together generate an, an infinite dimensional algebra called the Yangian symmetry. So let me just write that because it's important altogether. 
the closure of all of the above mentioned uh, symmetries is an infinite dimensional Yangian algebra. Okay. That is really cool and had, 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 yeah, it, yeah. I hope you hear more about it, but not from me, given the limited time. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I see Nima has been rescuing me in the chat. That's great. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, so is it correct to say that the three point graviton amplitude for real momenta is zero? Uh, yes. For the same reason that, that it is for uh, for Yangel's theory. In fact, the, the three point amp. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Uh, but then, how is it consist? I don't know if you were there for Shiraz's talk. He had some non-zero expression for three point graviton amplitude. Um, well, uh, I wasn't there, but he was also doing it various dimensions. What, what, was it? He also had non-zero in four dimensions. Yeah, I think so. Um, no, I think that's non-zero off-shell, not on-shell. Uh, um, that could be, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, are the momentum pieces particularly in four dimensions? I mean, can they be generalized to higher dimensions? Oh, I'm sorry. Could, could you say that again, please? Yeah. Uh, are the momentum twisters that you uh, described, uh -huh. can they be generalized to higher dimensions? No, not so easily. Um, okay. uh, for one, for one the, thing, sorry. I'm sorry? Yeah, be, because the matrix that you wrote down uh, with the Z uh, planes, so that looks yeah. like some Grassmannian matrix, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, exactly. And the Grassmannians, they can be generalized to higher dimensions yeah absolutely uh, so I this mean, uh, this here yeah the, the quotient of four by n matrices of this form at least when they have full rank modulo sl4 is of course the grassmannian gr4 comma n so you can you can hmm. trivially generalize that to gr um m comma n for for any m yeah. and and people in the amplitudes community often do do precisely that uh, as an instructive exercise um, to study various mathematical or, or you know, uh, mathematical properties of amplitudes. Uh, however, it's not the, so we often talk about the uh, lowercase m generalization of n equals four super Yang Mills theory, where we do precisely that. We, we consider Grassmannian m comma n. However, it's not the case that that corresponds to uh, kinematics in M space-time dimensions. So, um, yeah, so it's a useful thing to do. Uh, and people sometimes get confused because four accidentally equals four. Um, but it's not the case that if you go to the Grassmannian GR M comma N, that that is, means M space-time dimensions. Okay. And I missed one point, the xi variables that you introduced here, yeah, so those are points in the momentum space. And when you wait yeah. for the space, so are those, uh, I mean, do they remain as points or they become lines? Yeah, in this no. picture. Yeah, yeah, the x's are points. Uh, maybe I misdrew something here. Um, yeah, the x's are the locations of these vertices. But they correspond in the momentum. Uh, right, okay, yeah, I should say that each, each point uh, in X space corresponds to a line in twister space 
because it's the, it's the set of points that satisfy the incidence relation for that given x. And that collection of points is a line. It's a linear equation. The incidence relations are a linear equation, so they define a line. But, like if you look at this equation here, uh -huh. take a look just at the first equation here. If you give me some x uh, and you ask me what is the set of mu's and lambdas that satisfy this equation, well, it's a linear equation on four components, mu and lambda, so it defines a line. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. But yeah, but it's an unfortunate notation because, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't really mention the fact that many of you know, n equals four super diagnose theory, of course, has conformal invariance in position space. And usually when, when, you, when you use, in physics we have this, this is a lovely thing about physicists versus mathematicians. In physics, we have such huge biases according to what letter you use to denote a variable, right? Uh, 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 you know, mathematician would, would, wouldn't blink at letting a Q hat dot equal the position of some particle. You know, in, in, in physics, we're so wedded to the fact that X is a position coordinate um, and P is a momentum coordinate that an equation like this really throws us for a, 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 a really throws us for a loop because we see X and we think position space. But, but in fact, the, the dual conformal invariance, it acts on the X variables, but these X variables really live in momentum space. They have nothing to do naively or simply with the position space variables of uh, n equals four super Yang-Mills theory in position space. Hey Mark, can I make a quick comment? Please, although I, 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 I question your ability to do so <laughs> in terms of it being quick. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're very kind. You're very, very kind. But I'm happy to uh, open uh, the floor. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just, I just wanted to just, just to say a little bit more about, um, uh, about what, uh, what, what part of momentum twisters are special to four dimensions and sort of what's more, more general. Um, yeah. Sure. I mean, the, 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 the kind of zeroth order purpose of uh, twisters, maybe the most important purpose of them, uh, is to make the action of conformal symmetry as manifest as and simple as possible. And we know how to do that. Uh, the, the only general way we know how to do that in any number of dimensions is to use the embedding formalism. So uh, that's just the fact that in, uh, that if we have, uh, in, uh, if, if we have uh, a theory in a d-dimensional Minkowski space, um, uh, the uh, conformal group is SOD plus one comma one. And we know that the, that the, the place in which we make the action of the conformal symmetry is obvious as possible is to just introduce null vectors in, uh, in uh, d plus two dimensions with the d plus one comma, uh, uh, with the, um, with the uh, d comma two uh, signature. Um, so that's great. And, uh, and uh, that's that, uh, so if, if, we wanna, if we want to work with uh, conformal field theories in any number of dimensions, you better get used to thinking in uh, embedding space. Um, what's further, but there's still a metric. There's still this, uh, you know, in four dimensions in that language, we would have some six dimensional space with a, uh, with a uh, SO4 comma two metric. And uh, we think about points that live on that uh, hyperbola with X squared equals zero. Um, but there's still a metric there. Uh, what's special about uh, four dimensional twister space is this extra fact. Uh, and it's a kind of an extra fact about physics in four dimensions, period. It's sort of fascinating fact that uh, space-time symmetries act like linear transformations. So uh, the Lorentz group already, even the Minkowski signature is SL2C. All of a sudden, linear transformations uh, uh, come in. The conformal group, uh, the complex conformal group is SL4C. Uh, and, um, and that's, that's, this, uh, that's this, uh, 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 one of these small, uh, one of the small coincidences that SO6 is like SU4. So the uh, so so while we would use the embedding space in any number of dimensions, 
For the particular case of four dimensions, the, 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 uh, the, in the complex anyway, the, the embedding space is SO6. And so therefore it is useful to use this correspondence between uh, SO6 and SU4 uh, to uh, work with SU4. And, uh, and uh, the four of SU4 are the twisters that you are uh, talking about. What's nice about that is that now uh, is that um, uh, now the action of conformal symmetry in four dimensions is just SL4 and is simply acting on these four vectors like linear transformation. So it's impossible to find a more simple realization of uh, conformal symmetry in, um, in four dimensions. Are there any other questions? Okay, so maybe maybe we end here for today. Let's all thank Mark uh, for 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 the two wonderful talks. Um, it was a pleasure. <laughs>